Here is a list of considerations for the pregnant patient in the dental setting. We will discuss what teratogenic agents are and how and when they affect the developing embryo and fetus. Second, it is necessary to be familiar with scheduling dental hygiene care appointments in each trimester. Some trimesters are better suited for dental treatment. Third, oral manifestations will present during this time, such as pregnancy gingivitis. Fourth, we will look at what oral self-care recommendations look like for the pregnant patient. And finally, there are some strict chair and patient positions that must be followed for the pregnant patient. So we start off the lifespan with the pregnant patient. Here are some concerns. Um, some drugs are teratogens. So organogenesis is the production and the development of organs. We know from histo and embryology that the three germ layers, ecto, meso, and endoderm, turn into internal organs. We see this occurring in humans somewhere around the third to fourth week of gestation. The neural tube and notochord are the first major organs to form inside of the embryo, and they form out of the mesoderm by condensing into tissues and then folding over. Both of these structures become the central nervous system of a human adult. The FDA has established the FDA pregnancy category of drugs, and there are five categories, A, B, C, D, and X. You should be familiar with each of the categories, especially C, D, and X, and it is as it is explained in the course textbook. It is unrealistic that a pregnant person who has a chronic health condition can be taken off medications during pregnancy. So the lowest effective dose would be discussed, weighing the risk versus the benefit. Exposing the pregnant patients to ionizing ra radiation is also a major concern. The first trimester is the most crucial when cells are rapidly dividing and organs are developing. If the need overrides the risk, a lead shield should be used. And you want the lead shield to cover the front of the body and want to cover the back. Take the minimum amount of images and determine if a radiograph can wait until after the delivery of the child. Oh, and teratogens, I'm sorry, that is a drug that causes uh, birth defects. Something such as dilantin that we've talked about in the past causes gingival hypoplasia in patients that take it. But if you take it while pregnant, it may cause birth defects at about 5 to 10% of the birth. So which dental drugs are safe? So FDA category A and B drugs are safe to use in pregnancy. And lidocaine and epinephrine are category B drugs that are safe to use in pregnancy. However, there is a safe dosage that you must adhere to. If using epinephrine, then only two cartridges of 1 to 100,000 is acceptable. In addition, some antibiotics such as penicillin, amoxicillin, clindamycin, and some forms of erythromycin can be used. All tetracyclines must be avoided as it causes intrinsic staining of the teeth. Codeine and other opioid analgesics, benzodiazepines, should be avoided. NSAIDs like ibuprofen and aspirin should also be avoided. These can cause premature closing of the patent ductus arteriosus which complicates delivery and increases the, also increase the risk of maternal or fetal hemorrhage. A single exposure to nitrous oxide for no more than 35 minutes has not been associated with fetal disturbance or low birth weight. As you know, tobacco, drugs, and alcohol are unsafe for the developing embryo and fetus. There are also some herbal supplements, things like pennyroyal, like in the past, um, sometimes people would drink pennyroyal tea. Pennyroyal is a type of mint, and that would actually stimulate miscarriage in someone that would want to not be pregnant, like in the 17 or 1800s.
that is not a safe thing to do. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but there are some herbal supplements that can actually lead to miscarriage. So you would wanna check with your doctor before you were taking any herbal supplements. Treatment modifications are expected with the pregnant patient. Careful monitoring of blood pressure is crucial as high blood pressure, preeclampsia, and eclampsia can present. And this usually occurs in the 20th week of gestation. Patients with abnormal weight gain or high blood pressure should be referred to their medical doctor before dental hygiene treatment. Stress in the dental setting may further increase vital signs. Nausea is common during the first trimester, which can lead to enamel erosion. The patient may also be very tired, so you want to do shorter, more frequent recare or frequent appointments. We want to instruct the patient on how to remove local irritants like biofilm. Second trimester is sort of the sweet spot of seeing the pregnant patient because in the first trimester, there's a lot of nausea, there's a lot of vomiting. I mean, that can last all day, every day, but in the second trimester, usually that is starting to ebb or go away. And then in the third trimester, the patient is starting to get much larger, so it's harder to be reclined in the chair. So oral manifestations of pregnancy include pregnancy gingivitis, so the tissue may show signs of inflammation, enlargement, redness, um, bleeding or probing, hormonal factors, poor self-care, and also an increase of provotella intermedia have been found in gingivitis and also in the serum levels of hormones during pregnancy. Enamel erosion may result from um, continued vomiting and pregnancy granuloma, or it's also called a pregnancy tumor or a pyogenic granuloma may also present. So let's take a deeper dive into those. So pregnancy gingivitis, this is the most common thing that we'll see during pregnancy. It usually occurs in the second trimester, but also it may occur if someone is having infertility treatments. And it's an exaggerated response to the biofilm. And the response is influenced by the different hormones. There's also vascular changes that occur during pregnancy and an increase in the oral microbiota anaerobic bacteria. Enamel erosion, so that is the breakdown of enamel is due to repeated morning sickness or vomiting. The enamel starts to decalcify or break down and is softened by the acid from the stomach. If the patient brushes their teeth right away, they can actually mechanically remove the enamel. So instead of telling the patient to brush right away, we want to recommend an immediate rinse with sodium bicarbonate or milk of magnesia. That will help to neutralize the acid. They can also rinse with fluoridated water if milk of magnesia or sodium bicarbonate is not available. You want to recommend home fluoride rinses or a gel also chewing sugarless gum with xylitol. Xylitol is a sugar alcohol. Any sugar alcohol you ingest, sorbitol, xylitol, mannitol, any of them can lead to uh, a lot more farts and diarrhea. So patients should be made aware that if they are chewing this, that it can lead to that as a consequence. Um, helps to fight decay, but it also it makes you really gassy. In this little soft spot right here, this is a pregnancy a granuloma, also known as AKA pyogenic granuloma. Let's look at these words. Gen means creation of, pyo means pus. Creation of pus Granuloma, oma is tuma, granula, granulo means granular tissue. So we have a pus forming tumor of granulation tissue. Delicious. It's benign, it's an inflammatory lesion, it's usually isolated, it's soft, usually occurs interdentally or in between the teeth. 
It bleeds like crazy, but it doesn't cause any pain. Sometimes they can just go in and snip it, but usually it will grow back. All these wonderful hormones, all these things. All right, patient positioning, especially important in the third trimester. You recline that patient back. The baby is going to press on their inferior vena cava, preventing the blood from getting back to the heart, trapping it in the legs. The patient can have supine hypotensive pregnancy syndrome where they feel weak and faint. You want always to keep the patient that is largely pregnant semi-supine, right? So we're in between upright and completely flat and put support on their right hip. So instructions for the patient. Control the biofilm as best as possible to prevent pregnancy gingivitis, periodontitis, and there is you know, I don't know how strong the correlation is between preterm babies and periodontitis. There's a lot of other cofactors that go along with that. So it's not a clear correlation that if you have periodontal disease, you will de deliver a baby prematurely. So the more that they can control the biofilm. You know, and you want to use motivational interviewing if the patient has been vomiting every day, all day. You know, the last thing they want to hear is put a toothbrush in your mouth, right? So that can, you can really see home care suffer during that time if the person's been sick a lot. Dietary needs of pregnancy, nutritional counseling, and things like that will be under the umbrella of the OBGYN. And here we see folate. Thank you, Knock, for... Um, clarifying for me that folate is B9. Um, folate is an umbrella term. Folic acid is under folate B9, and that's to prevent neural tube defects such as spina bifida. Let's go spina bifida occulta. It's hidden. You can't see it. And then you have the myelomyangocele, which is the worst with um, paralysis, and then just the meningioseal, which is the pouch, but no paralysis. Carries control, right? Old wives' tale. An old wives' tale is something that, that a story that is sort of passed from generation to generation. It's not necessarily true. So a patient may tell you they've lost a tooth for every baby they have because the baby sucked all the calcium out. That doesn't actually happen, although the baby will suck out anything from the mother um, that it is missing. So, um, but it doesn't actually remove calcium from the mother's teeth, maybe from the bones. So you don't, that's a wives' tale. And then also we want to talk about ECC, um, early childhood caries also known as um, baby bottle carries, also known as nursing bottle carries. And we'll take a closer look at that. Okay, so now the baby is here. Yay, the baby's been born. We're not sick anymore. The most significant influence for the child is the parents or the primary caregiver. So the oral health education of the child begins with educating the parents. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentists recommends that a child have their first dental visit between 6 to 12 months of age. This is to establish a dental home. If there's a problem, there's someone that can see the child. Um, also, anticipatory guidance for parents. You know, you want to get in there before the parent is putting the child to bed until they're three years old with a sippy cup of juice. Um, a plan for a acute trauma. Kids love falling and knocking their teeth out or making their front teeth turn gray. Um, dietary counseling, you know, we don't want to be doing, pay, people think raisins are a great snack, right? Dried fruit, but raisins, oh my gosh, they love to decay teeth down to little stubs. And then carries risk assessment. 
does the parent have a lot of caries? Are they going to transmit this infectious disease to their child? So some familial risk factors um, for child, uh, child developing dental problems, a low socioeconomic status, little or no home care, infrequent dental care, there's no belief in the family in prevention. Like sometimes, you know, and this, this is also sort of, um, we might consider this also an old wives tale, patients will think, well, they lose all those teeth, so I don't have to worry about those because they're temporary, and that's really not the case. Um, does the parent have a fear of dentistry? What's the parental sibling dental history? Presence of streptococcus mutans in the primary caregiver or close relative or daycare staff indicates that the child may catch this infectious disease of caries. Health considerations of the child, was it a premature birth? Did they have a low birth weight? Did they have a severe or chronic illness? Any developmental disabilities or frequent use of sweetened medications? That pink stuff, um, the Augmentin that we used to give children for ear infections, oh, that tasted like bubblegum delicious. So kids have ear infections all the time and are swallowing that all the time. That is sweetened medication. Some dietary considerations, putting sweetened beverages in a bottle or a cup, using the bottle as a pacifier, putting the baby to bed with a bottle, and frequency of sugar or starch, simple starch exposures. Does a child drink fluoridated water? Should they have fluoride supplementation? When should a child be exposed to the topical methods of fluoride? So let's look at non-nutritive sucking. And people will go crazy about this because they don't like the child sucking their thumbs, fingers, or passies. That's what I call a pacifier, a passy. This non-nutritive, meaning they're not getting any nutrients, they're just sucking, is normal and expected. So Opting pacifier or thumb, digit, digit is fingers um, sucking. So there is a belief, oh, if you give them a passy, you can take the passy away. You can't take the thumb or the fingers away, so you should try to get them on the pacifier. If a child is a thumb sucker, good luck trying to give them a pacifier. And, you know, we're only little for a short period of time, so I don't really get too upset about those types of things. Orthodontic design pacifiers, you know, maybe preventing the open bite. And why shouldn't the caregiver give use their own saliva to clean off the pacifier? So for any of uh, my parents out there listening in, you know, I don't know, you're at Disney World, your, your beloved takes their pacifier and throws it on the ground, and you're like, great, how do I clean it? So you stick it in your mouth and you clean it, and then you stick it in their mouth. So they, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to run around and try to find a bathroom to clean it off with soap and water before putting it in the child's mouth. Do these things make sense logistically? If you have three children with you, probably not. The thought is if you have decay, the decay bugs like S. mutans, and you lick their pacifier, you're going to transmit it to their mouth. If you read enough literature, they also tell you not to kiss your baby anymore on the mouth because you can transmit the germs. But I love kissing babies, and I'm not going to stop doing it. So... You can do whatever you want. All right, feeding. You should only have formula or milk in the bottle, right? We're not putting Mountain Dew. We're not putting juice. You should hold the baby during feeding, not propping. Switch the baby to a cup by 12 months. If you have to give the bottle at bedtime, only water. And, of course, it's preferable not to put the baby to bed with the bottle but, you know, also motivational interviewing. You're not there at midnight when the child is screaming. So next best thing is water. And if they tell you they're putting the baby to bed with juice, 
in the in the bottle say okay it's not great it can rot their teeth start adding water to it every night and increasing the amount of water so you're sort of weaning them off the sugar all right teething right so babies oh they can cry and drool and be pretty much in a bad mood when they're when their teeth are coming in however like things like high fever and diarrhea that's not a part of teething um, inform parents to look for changes or malformed teeth, color changes of the teeth, I'm sorry, um, methods for relief. So there are those things like, I think it's called Ambisol, and that's an over-the-counter sort of numbing drop. However, that can be dangerous in large amounts because don't forget, the child is swallowing it. You're better off um, chilling like a teething ring or a washcloth cold like make it cold and they can chew on it biofilm removal um, knee to knee which means two adults knee to knee and then the daily and then the child kind of is it lay or lie now I lay me down lay and lie spoons whatever it is right put the child between you on their back on, on the child's back and then you can wipe off the alveolar ridge and mucosa brushing newly erupted teeth with a tiny little brush and water and emphasize brushing and cleaning in the morning and before bed here is the fluoride supplementation schedule so you can see birth to six months is none six months to three years only if they have less than 0.3 parts per million of fluoride in their water. So it depends on a couple of things, how much fluoride is in their water supply and also how hot is the climate because the hotter the climate, the more water people tend to ingest. So there's whole bunches of different fluoride supplementation tables. So what's the big deal with the fluoride? So let's see, enamel remineralization in the presence of fluoride. Adding fluoride to a patient's home care enhances remineralization significantly. So when fluoride is present in saliva, fluorapatite instead of hydroxyapatite forms during the remineralization process. Calcium fluorapatite is more resistant to acid than calcium hydroxyapatite. So the critical pH of hydroxyapatite is around 5.5. Well, fluorapatite doesn't start demineralizing to four, at 4.5, and that's why topical fluoride treatments help <clears throat> um, patients because below the critical pH, demineralization occurs. So your pH um, can actually go lower when it's it's floor appetite, not hydroxy appetite. Educate parents about hidden sugars, the dangers of sippy cups. And sippy cups, right, so there was a time that sippy cups did not exist, right? If the child wanted to drink, you'd have to sit down and drink your drink. So sippy cups made it so that the child can be walking around with drinks all day long. And if it's something other than water, then they're having chronic exposure over and over again, especially if something, you know, even milk has um, lactose in it, so a type of sugar. And if it's, they're drinking it all day long, they're having that pH drop in their mouth and sugar and acid form in their mouth and they can get a lot of decay. So, and also rinsing their mouth with water following the administration of sweetened medicines. Hey, here's what knee to knee looks like. Look at the first dental visit. Oh boy, they're holding the baby down. All right, so the purpose of that is to get a dental home and make sure um, to provide interventions before we have big problems. You want to get a medical history, um, do a caries risk assessment, diet, feeding pattern, lack of oral hygiene care, vertical transmission, fluoride, biofilm removal with a dampened soft infant toothbrush, 
Varnish is recommended for children beginning at age six months to one year who are moderate to high risk of early childhood caries. All right, the young child accidents, they love falling, right? They're more active and subject to injuries. Provide written information what to do with a traumatic injury. Why a deciduous incisor should not be put back in if it's knocked out. You know, you can um, actually impact the developing adult tooth underneath it. You don't want to take baby tooths and shove them back in. Adult tooths, yes, but not with deciduous teeth because you can really impact um, the developing bud of the adult tooth. What happens if the deciduous tooth discolors? Bring the child um, to the dental office if there is an accident. Soft diet, keeping area clean. All right, so let's take a look here. So you can see this child bumped this tooth, it turned black. Um, it's from blood getting in there and dissolving. And so that's what the it looks like. If it hasn't abscessed, probably just leave it alone until it falls out. Here, this is this the adult tooth? I'm thinking this might be the adult teeth here. This has been like, this child needs to go to the dentist. This has been knocked in. Um, so that's quite an injury. So broken front tooth could be from sports, could be from child abuse. See the child immediately, document the incident. You want a pulp test, is the tooth still alive? And then x-ray. This is avulsed teeth, right? They've been knocked out sometimes from a fall. Here you can't read this, it's too small. I'm going to pass this out. Um, when we come to class on Wednesday, it's about treatment. How, what do you do with an adult tooth that's been knocked out? Um, how to treat it, how to handle it. And we will look at that paper together on Wednesday. So for the little ones, right, we want to establish a routine, emphasizing brushing before bed, maybe using a disclosing solution, timers. When can they do it on their own? It's later than you think, right? Sometimes parents leave like a three or four year old to do it on their own. And it, you really need to be monitoring them probably up to about six, maybe for a young boy up to about 17 right teen boys we'll talk about them lots of lots of plaque <laughs> um, does a young child need to floss so we have those little dinosaur plackers that gets them used to having the string between their teeth you don't you don't want to hand that to a two-year-old but if you can get them used to the feeling of it you should be doing it all right fluoride when do they need fluoride you want to uh, Assess the amount in the water and other sources. Grain of rice, amount of toothpaste 12 months to three years. Just put it on the occlusal. Small P, three years to six years. And then, excuse me, fluoride rinses are not recommended before age six. Before age six, the child does not have the musculature development and maturation to actually swish and spit. So everything you put in their mouth, they're going to tell you they're going to spit. They're swallowing all of it. They don't have the physical capacity to swish and spit. So that's why we use such a small amount. We want to explain to the parent or caregiver limiting drinks from sippy cups, sweetened drinks, healthy snack choices, um, hidden sugars, avoid soda and using food as a reward, and limiting eating between meals. Early childhood caries. So we need to prevent tipping the balance from demineralization towards remineralization. The role of Streptococcus mutans, so we can have it transferred vertically from <clears throat> parent or caregiver to child. So that's kind of like adult to child. Or they can also transmit it horizontally. You know, if you have a whole bunch of children in your home, this one's licking, that one's licking, this one's in the mouth, that's in the mouth. 
Everybody is drooling all over everybody else. So that would be a horizontal transmission. Some of the risk factors we already talked about. Um, if the parent doesn't think that, you know, they think that this is a replaceable set of teeth, it doesn't matter. They are afraid of the dentist. They don't want to go to the dentist. And what are some of the effects of having early childhood caries? So what is it? It's decay in the deciduous tooth of a child under the age of six. So caries is an infectious disease that is preventable. You can eliminate the bacteria by removing the biofilm or breaking up the bacterial matrix, matrices that form. You can eliminate the nutritional factor, the sugar and fermentable carbohydrates, and you can also strengthen the enamel, right? So getting rid of decay, the causes of decay, it's a triangle, fermentable carbohydrates, susceptible tooth surface, and bacteria. You need to sort of break it, break that triangle by eliminating one of those factors so that the decay doesn't form. <clears throat> So detecting early childhood caries, it's usually at the cervical, which is the gum line here on anterior deciduous teeth. And we can see this is decay at this point. The lesion is usually parallel to the gum line. The risk factors, premature low birth weight, medications containing sugar, low socioeconomic educational status of parents, and feeding behaviors. So what people don't realize, especially the feeding behaviors of putting the child to bed with a bottle with juice. So the child sucks, right, sucks. But as a child falls asleep, the child doesn't <clears throat> swallow the last suck. So that liquid pools in the child's mouth and it's, it just causes tremendous decay because they don't swallow the last suck of the bottle. So what are some of the effects? And we can see white spots, moderate, and advanced. So early childhood caries is the presence of one or more decayed, missing or filled primary teeth and child aged five years or younger. It begins with white spot lesions, little white spots here, in the maxillary primary incisors along the margin of the gingiva. And if the disease continues, it can lead to a complete destruction of the crown of the tooth, as we can see here. So what are the effects of it? So they may lose, the child may lose their deciduous teeth. Extensive and traumatic dental treatment in a young child. And then psychosocial issues, right? Little kids are cruel. If they see, you know, little kids will look at you and be like, your teeth are yellow. And if they see a child with, why do your teeth look like that? And they will call it out. So that is, you know, very traumatizing socially for the young child. How do we prevent it? Remove the biofilm. Look at the dietary patterns, fluoride therapies, and also chewing xylitol, that sugar alcohol gum that has been shown to reduce caries. So the dental office visit purpose at for the young child, we're going to assess their oral health, do some prevention strategies, establish a rapport. They know you, they like you, you're nice, and discover practices that may be harmful to oral health. How do we manage these patients? You tell them, you show them, and then you do it. Voice control. So the voice control is a technique. You know, you're in charge. You may do some distraction techniques, nonverbal communication, modeling, positive reinforcement some sedation, gentle restraints, general anesthesia, parent, present, or absent. So from the dental health professional perspective, it's easier to treat someone, a child, when the parent is not present. As a parent and advocate, 
No one's treating my child without my eyes on them. So we must be respectful. You know, in, in modern society, parents are, you know, want to see what's happening. Children that have undergone general anesthesia, and we'll look at some of these, these beautiful babies that have died during dental treatment. Um, in one case, the, the assistant turned off the alarm bell because they thought it was annoying, but the alarm bell was signaling that the child wasn't um, breathing correctly and the child passed away. So, you know, parents sometimes are going to want to be there and be watching what you're doing. And that's okay. How do we assess them, right? We look at their ginger, we look at caries, which primary molars are used for occlusion. Those are our second molars, primary second molars in the young child. Digital images, why and when. So that would probably depend on um, what the teeth look like. Usually, I would say if the child has been coming in regularly and you've been taking a look, if they let you do it around four, four to six, it really depends on how the child will sit for them. Usually by six, they will sit and you can take some bite wing images. Occlusion, what are you looking for? So you're looking at those second molars and then uh, lack of spacing, malposition, crowding, any congenitally missing teeth, slow eruption, all these things. And then oral habits. Do they suck their thumb or fingers? You'll see a little sore on the finger that they suck on. Are they still using a passy? Taking a bottle to bed. So should we selectively motor or engine polish a young child's teeth? Probably not, right? Because um, deciduous teeth are so, they have no texture. They're so smooth that you can remove all the biofilm with a toothbrush and dental floss and then fluoride varnish. So um, is, and that is the recommended method for across the lifespan up through um, adolescence. Ah, so oral habits, so bruxism, teeth grinding, all little kids, anyone here that's a parent, if you listen at night, you can hear children grinding the heck out of their teeth. There's really not much you can do about it. They're not going to wear um, a night guard. Personally, this is, has no evidence. It's not evidence-based at all. There must be some physiologic function. Children are not under stress. There has to be something with why they grind their teeth. I don't know what it is, but it seems like part of the human condition, bruxism. So they can grind the heck out of their teeth. They'll be all flat by the time the teeth are ready to fall out. Tongue thrusting reverse swallow. Usually when you swallow or say the letter S, the tongue tip should go to the palate. Some children have learned to thrust their tongue forward and it can create an open bite. So if you see the tongue coming forward, I say, say silly, and then I part their lips and I'm like, swallow. And if their tongue comes forward through an open bite, that's called reverse swallow or tongue thrusting. And then thumb or digit finger sucking needs intervention if child continues beyond the age of four. And that is according to the literature. Um, I've seen it all. Parents put disgusting tasting things on their child's thumb and the child ends up still sucking the thumb and throwing up the disgusting stuff. I don't know. Sometimes it seems like there will be bigger problems, right? But four. That's according to the literature. 
So <clears throat> early orthodontics, and I'm not going to talk much about orthodontics. I'm going to skip through this part because we're going to have our guest speaker come on Monday to talk about ortho. So I will say this. So the primary teeth, which you're looking for occlusion, <clears throat> you look for the in the primary teeth, the second molars, and you're looking for something called flush terminal plane. That usually indicates they're going to be a class one bite. So basically the second molar is stacked one on top of the other, and that's called flush terminal plane. And all of these primate spacing, leeway space, problems, interceptive orthodontics, we will talk about on Monday. All right, so oral habits here. You can see these are other, th look at this cage that they put in this child's mouth. <laughs> oh my God. So this is cemented in, and this prevents the thumb from going in, and it also prevents um, the tongue from coming forward. So you can see that they're biting on their back teeth, and they are wide open here. <clears throat> Space maintainer, we'll talk about that on Monday. That's if you have to take out a deciduous tooth. They will place the space maintainer to maintain the space so these teeth don't drift in and block out the adult tooth. Palatal expander, there's a little key and they actually are trying to split the median palatine suture here. They split it, split it open over time to make the maxilla wider. And then serial extractions we'll also talk about on Monday. So there's a lot we can skip for this one, which is good because this is long. All right, child with special needs. <clears throat> so the child may have an intellectual development disability, also sometimes called a cognitive disability. Um, sometimes it's caused from a genetic condition such as Down syndrome. Sometimes it's not genetic, something that happened prenatally, perinatally, they lost oxygen during birth, um, or postnatally, you know, exposed to lead paint. Um, and it can also have a psychological condition um, quality to it. And this is the IQ, um, which is the intelligence quotient is what it's called, and what how they would classify the person. So classification, if someone has mild intellectual developmental disability, um, the self-care can be done by the individual. Um, you can teach them oral hygiene instruction by practicing. So someone with a moderate intellectual developmental disability might have trouble with coordination. Um, teach oral hygiene by showing and telling and then reward successes. And then someone with a severe intellectual developmental disability learns by repetition, habit training, and reward. Oral findings, you may find tooth anomalies, periodontal infection, bruxism, mouth breathing, tongue thrust, enlarged lips and tongue, and caries. So Down syndrome, the child is born with an extra chromosome on um, 21 or chromosome 21 attaches to another chromosome. So it's an abnormal cell division prior to or during conception. The parental age is a factor. <clears throat> Prenatal screening has lowered the incidence of Down syndrome births. Some of the characteristics, short stature, <clears throat> underdeveloped nose, eyes have an epicanthic fold of skin. Small hands can have an awkward gait. The IQ is usually below 70. Sociable personality, mischievous and stubborn. Some health-related issues to Down syndrome. They have a higher susceptibility to infection. They can have an obstructed airway. Um, they can have congenital heart defects, septal defects, mitral valve prolapse and they are also at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Fetal alcohol syndrome, so alcohol causes nerve damage and cell loss in the fetal brain. They will usually have a smaller head size. Characteristic facial features, 
short palpable fissures, a thin upper lip, long smooth philtrum, epicanthal folds, and flat nasal bridge. They also may be short in stature and have central nervous system abnormalities, things like seizures, things like that. So we can see here the smooth philtrum, the very thin upper lip, the flat nasal bridge, so it's up here, this flat nasal bridge, epicanthal folds is this sort of stripe right here. You can see it right here. It kind of covers, so in the morning when you wake up, we have sort of like that eye, like crusty, it's like in that portion of the eye. Autism spectrum disorder, neurological disorder affecting the function of the brain. So they may have um, difficulties with communication and social interaction, and it's usually diagnosed within the first three years of life. There is a spectrum of autism, meaning someone may have it very mild all the way to a significant um, difficulty with communication and social interaction. The cause at this point is unknown. Genetic reasons may be um, viral, chemicals, hypoxia at birth. The incidence is increasing every year. It's about 1 in 150 births with a greater incidence in males. So based on the severity of symptoms, social interactions can be problematic. Verbal and nonverbal communication is also problematic. They may have ritualistic or compulsive behaviors. So sometimes um, you could see like a tippy toe walk on the tips of their toes and also they um, make exaggerated motions sometimes with their arms and hands. And they may have an unlikely response. You may think, oh, this child is very mild and they're gonna be great and they know me, but in an unknown environment, they may have, um, an unlikely response. You think they're going to be great and then they actually struggle with the appointment. So medical treatment, they may take drugs to manage their behaviors. They may also do cognitive behavioral therapy. So dental hygiene care. So if the person is on the significant end of the spectrum, they may require sedation. They are susceptible to caries and poor oral hygiene. Why? You know, they may not want someone brushing their teeth. They may refuse help. They may be combative when the caregiver is trying to brush their teeth. Talk to the parent prior to treatment. What do you want to know? You know, is there like something that they would love to hold on to during the treatment? Um, are they better if you show them on the model first, let them hold it, and then you do it? Like, what's the best way? to manage this patient and keep the dental care consistent, same provider, same room, um, and build that relationship. Ah, that's it. All right, I look forward to seeing everybody on Wednesday, and you'll have a copy of this, and I will give you that traumatic, um, is it traumatic avulsion of a tooth chart.